I'm infinitely full of hope to, to reduce it to something really productive because it does a lot of things is you talking about why you think it's cool to have kids going through the process of you and your partner kind of navigating morally and ethically what it means to be parents in this world. And I think this is important because, you know, we did a video kind of recently um, at Wisecrack that talked about antinatalism and got into, um, oh, what's the South African guy that hates kids? Benatar, David Benatar. Yeah, Benatar. We <laughs> talked about Edelman and some other figures. And for, for anyone listening who doesn't know what, you know, um, what antinatalism is, um, it's this idea that like, to be really reductive that it's unethical to have kids that like you shouldn't do it whether that's because you're creating suffering or you're participating in some patriarchal heteronormative structure of power or you're killing the planet by having kids and in a lot of kind of like philosophical circles leftist circles edgy millennial circles it's become a really common conversation about like should we have kids is it bad how could i do this morally and i've been in settings with friends who have been like i just don't know how anyone could have a kid right now, right? It's a thing that I think all of us have heard. So before you dive into that, Serbi, I'm curious about this. Is this something you ever like think about, talk about? I think we've like chatted about it a little bit yeah. on the show before, but like, I don't know, in general, is that like a thing that comes up in, in your life talking to friends and what sort of stuff do you hear in those conversations? It does. It does a lot. And I think, um, so just in, in, in a previous episode, I did mention that I wanted kids so much like I was like when I grow up I want to be a mom that would be amazing um when you grow last... up because you're currently 15 I hope everyone <laughs> yes. knows that Servi is a really exactly. smart 15 year old I'm a child so um when when I I would say in the last six months so I don't feel that way anymore I feel a lot more cautious and concerned and I think that maybe I don't want to have children and it's not because I don't love kids or don't want to be a mom, but just I feel uncomfortable with the idea um, of having a child right now or just bringing a child. And maybe I might adopt or something um, one day. But I do talk about this a lot with my friends. And I would say it's split 50-50. Um, and my friends meaning a lot of the the female friends that I have. So half already have children and the other half says they don't want kids for the same reasons. Um, so I think it's interesting the how much I've changed in six months. Um, maybe it's because of the pandemic or because I'm not in a relationship or whatever. It's given me more time to think or maybe just to question that it doesn't have to be the le next logical step when you get older. It's not like a, a a necessary phase in my life cycle it could just be like i don't have to have kids i i, I guess then uh tom and this is you know just no thinking about it from the book so you're pretty clear in the book that like you and your partner um always knew you wanted to have children that's something you thought would be fun cool good um inspiring hopeful all these things so for you like did you start from a place of having your sort of like human brain that was like, yes, this is great. I want to create life with my partner. And a bit of that like thinky philosophy brain that was like, but is this technically a good thing? Or, I mean, were you, did you exist in that space at all before you had had your child? Um, I mean, actually, to be honest, if I'm really honest, I think that, that, that kind of like thinky philosophy space actually only really opened up in the same way, like once the child had been conceived and I saw okay. my son on, on the scan, which is so, it, you know, it, it came a bit too late, perhaps. Perhaps I wasn't thinking <laughs> enough. Um, you know, uh, I, I, in fact, I mean, before we did con see a child, I, my my worries were almost always well, just like practical, kind of economic um, sort of worries. Like, how could we ever afford to have a child? Um, or you know, would we have? Would we? Would I actually be physically sort of able to look after a child? Um, you know, those sorts of worries. Um, and then I saw my child on the scan. I was like, oh, shit, this is a person, right? <laughs> I, have actual du I do actually have, you know, duties. Um, to, it isn't just something that we, we want. It's something I have duties to. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, um, I, and I think, but I mean, it's kind of like, I suppose, in my defense, I think it's a lot easier to, to feel that you have duties to some something that exists as opposed to a merely hypothetical child you might not even have. So one of the aspects of the book, I'm curious, you know, here you talk about this, Tom, and here you think about this, Serbi, um, is 
this idea that to be really crass with it, and everyone should read the book. Um, but but the idea that we can hope for things, and part of what it means to have a child is that we can hope for a more collective we rather than an I. So that rather than only doing things because hopefully it makes my life better in having a child and, and helping it grow and, and be like a cool person and stuff, um, I'm participating in hope for a future. And and to really quickly divert into like philosophy land, um, some of that argument reminded me of like a French philosopher, Alain Bedieu, who is really into the idea of like, you know, collective subjects, so just groups of people um, that make something really cool happen. He calls that being immortal because it means that while you're not going to live forever like a vampire, if you're a part of a cool artistic movement or a scientific development or a romance or politics or whatever, you're participating in a thing that's going to live on after you. So that's like a little bit of what I was getting from the book that that having children is a way to like participate in acts of hope for the future, even if that means it's not like, <coughs> sorry, our future. Um, is that a f fair interpretation of your work? It's a great, it's a great interpretation of my work. Yeah, you couldn't, I couldn't have put it better myself. I mean, hopefully, I mean, I might have put it better in the book, I don't know, but I, I, I couldn't put it better in myself right now because I did write most of the book before I had a toddler. Um, but um, what I would say about, like, I think this is like the sort of, um, yeah, the sort of one of the most important points to me is, and one of the most important kind of experiences I I've had in sort of becoming a, a parent. And one of the reasons I'd recommend parenthood is that once you have a sort of child, you don't really matter so much anymore. You know, um, your your you know your um, uh, needs aren't really at the forefront of your life anymore, um, and um that's sort of really liberating i think in the kind of society we have where we're meant to you know um uh you know act in our own sort of like selfish interest over time it's sort of wonderful to to have a reason not to so what you're saying about um having a child and it sort of adds another variable into the world this is this is just me paraphrasing or whatever but um you add another variable into the world and then it could help the future that's how i've always thought about it when I wanted children was I'm going to raise considerate, empathetic, strong children that will hopefully do something really wonderful in the world one day. And whether that's on like a micro level with just helping individual people or a macro level and maybe go into some sort of function that would um, be able to affect positive change on a greater scale. However, I, I wonder what, ha like, I don't, I mean, do you know like why I changed? Like, is it, do you think it's anxiety? <laughs> do you think it's the pandemic? Like, because it was really just six months ago, I was like, no, like I can't do that. I still just can't have kids, even though I I wanted to have them for all the same reasons that you've, you've discussed on this podcast in your book. And then suddenly it was like, no, I can't do it. Like for me, I just can't do it. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess, I, you know, it's, it's obviously like this like, you know, part of the idea is that, you know, your kids might do things wonderful in the world. But I suppose, like, you know, there's obviously kind of very real you know, concerns about that might just be so totally irrational. But actually, you know, your kids, for one thing, is human beings, right? So just like every other human being, right, they're going to be flawed in all sorts of ways, regardless of how good a parent you may have. You know, it's, it's it feels almost a bit like you're you're kind of passing the buck, right? You're going, well, you know, you you guys have to do it, but you know, you're, you're the next generation or sort of that. We can't, you know, we're, we're too far gone, but we can, you know, so, um, yeah. So I guess like, you know, what I would sort of em emphasize in, in kind of response to that would be the, um, you know, in line with the stuff I've said about, you know, parenthood kind of like giving you a kind of reason not to act in your own selfish interest, you know, raising children, uh wasn't to be something that you know you just do for your own kind of so to um to sort of placate your ego or to kind of, as a as a as a as an individual as a, as a parent right raising children is something kind of like which also um ought to be done in a social uh level and once you have a once you have a child um i think this sort of become so sort of, sort of obvious that um 
we are not biologically meant to raise children in like two parent families, right? Children, small children need vastly more attention than two human beings, no matter how dedicated, could possibly give them. Philosopher and screenwriter Justin Boyd in the chat says this. He says, well, so much hope rhetoric um, covertly assumes that there is some solution out there guaranteed somewhere so that even if we aren't smart enough to figure it out, someone will. And then he says, and that's not true. So I wonder what you make of that, this idea that a lot of rhetoric around hope, and I think this this does kind of relate to like the theological type of hope we were talking about. So what do you make of that? The idea that like hope rhetoric assumes that like, even if we can't make the world better, some magical person in the future will, and whether or not that's a way to think about it, helpful to think about it, or just straight up not true. So I'm curious what you think about that. Well, I think it's, it's true in so far as hope as a concept only really emerges in conditions of uncertainty, right? Um, so, I mean, if you knew that someone was going to come along and solve it, then you wouldn't need to be hopeful, but you just have you know, knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, so, yeah, um, I mean, the question then is what do you do about uncertainty, right? How are you going to orient yourself towards it? I mean, in the book, this is part of my argument, but um, you... I, I want to argue that you're not kind of properly hopeful if you kind of orient yourself <clears throat> passively towards that uncertainty and you kind of just go, well, you know, maybe something will happen, maybe it won't, um, you know, if it's God's will or whatever, then, then something will happen, someone will come and save it to me. Uh, or like, you know, uh, you, know which, which you could you could say God in that situation, you could say kind of future generations of, of human beings, oh, they'll, they'll find something, else, you know, who cares, right? Um, I think the... You know, I want to, what I want to argue is that a properly hopeful way to orient yourself in that uncertainty is to kind of find ways of actively um, bringing up, bringing about better states of affairs, basically. Um, and you know, of course, when you're oriented towards that rationally, it might at some point come about where you just go, "There's nothing I can do. Right? There's nothing anyone can do." But again, the kind of, the, the, you know, the sort of right way of seeing that to my mind is to, is to not go easily into despair. I, right now, there is a tendency for people to go very easily into despair. Mm -hmm. Because despair can be very comforting because if you're in total despair or if you kind of, you act as if you are, you don't need to do anything, do you? But if you go, well, we're fucked, the world's going to end anyway, regardless of what I, I or anyone else does, we're doomed, then you can just live your life as you were. Right? You don't have to change anything. But if you take seriously the possibility of doing something, of things being different, then you actually do have to do things that are different, regardless of whether or not you know they're going to work. 